in defense of financial markets. Lecture seven. Okay, this is our last class. So let's um, summarize where we are in terms of the material. We started out discussing the attack on financial markets, uh, financial institutions, and financiers. We talked about the productive role of financial markets, the economic role that they play. We saw how important they are. And then we discussed some of the causes for the attack. Okay. The last few classes, we've been talking about the stock market, corporate restructuring, takeovers, LBOs. And we've seen the, um, the beneficial effects of these transactions on the one hand, on the other hand, the extent to which the people that participated in these events were persecuted, were villainized, some of them actually went to jail. None of the people involved had a good defense for what they did. What I'd like to do in this class today is to end this course by discussing how financial institutions, financial markets, the financiers themselves should defend themselves, should be defended. Okay, now I'd like to start by discussing how non-objectivists tend to defend these markets. So what are the common defenses used? And I will take, I will discuss two common uh, defenders or people who present themselves as defenders. We will talk about the conservatives and the libertarians. And then we'll get to what is a proper defense. Right, let's talk about the conservatives. How do conservatives defend their support of financial markets and institutions? And more generally, how do they defend their support of capitalism? What do they use? What's the common good? So basically, they say financial markets are good. Capitalism is good for utilitarian reasons. They maximize social well-being. So they defend financial markets. They defend capitalism from the perspective of altruism. They say it is good because it maximizes the benefit to other people. And this idea goes back to Adam Smith, the father of modern economics. Okay. His idea was that, yeah, businessmen are selfish. And even though selfishness is bad, even though it's despicable, the consequences of that selfishness are good. Because through this mechanism of the invisible hand, everybody benefits from the fact that the businessman is selfish. See, even though the motive of the businessman is bad, is, uh, is immoral, the consequences are good. And this is the standard party line among conservatives. Selfishness and greed are evil, but we want the effect. Okay? They want the effect without really wanting the cause. So for example, conservatives will say, you know, we need to pay CEOs a lot of money because it motivates them to do, to work hard. Motivates them to work hard, they produce more, which benefits society. But then they have a problem. Somebody like Michael Milken comes around and earns $500 million a year. Or Michael Eisner, who made $200 million a year. At some point, the incentive is not a feature. I mean, what's the difference from a from their point of view, between one million and a hundred million. In both cases, you're very, very rich. So they say, well, we support high salaries to CEO, but up to a limit. Beyond that limit, it isn't altruistic anymore. It doesn't provide that additional incentive anymore. So high salaries are good up to some level. Beyond that, we should regulate them, we should curb them. Or greed is good up to a certain point. You can be greedy as, as long as you're accumulating wealth and that wealth is within reasonable, a reasonable amount, that's okay. 
But, you know, if you become too extravagant, if there's too much of it, that's bad. What is the standard by which businessmen are judged by? Is it by their ability to produce? Okay. Under this, under, for the conservatives, who's a good businessman and who's a bad businessman? Well, the good businessman is the business and then makes a lot of money and then does what with the money? Gives it away. Gives it away, okay. Gives it away to charity. And this is, by the way, Michael Milken's defense in his trial was that, yes, he made a lot of money, but look at all the good things he's done. He's given to this society and that society and this charity and that charity. That was pretty much the extent of his attempt to defend himself. Now, here's a uh, quote from Harry Malkowitz, who uh, is a Nobel Prize, won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1990. And this is from an article he wrote called Markets and Morality. And I think this is a great quote in illustrating exactly this point. What do they perceive as good and what is bad? He's talking about the 1980s. He says, the blanket condemnation of the greedies of the 1980s blurs other important distinctions. So he says, don't lump all these people together in one group. It lumps together people who were remarkably stingy with those who were remarkably generous, either with public donations to good causes or with quiet private help to others in need. It lumps together those whose sole interest in life was winning of the finance game as measured by their accumulated wealth and those who played the game well accumulated fortunes but found time for other interests. So if you were in finance because you loved it and really wanted to do this well and that was the focus of your life and you accumulated lots of money, that's bad. If you really cared about it but you had other interests, you made to the opera and you, you did other things in life at the same time and you helped the needy, if you were more, had other interests, then it was okay. If you gave your money to charity, it was good. If you didn't, then you get lumped together. You're, you're lumping together good guys and bad guys. Good guys are the ones who give to charity. The bad guys are the ones who don't. This is the standard that conservatives use. And why? It's because they're altruists. You cannot fit together the ethics of sacrifice, the idea that our goal in life is to sacrifice to other people with a free market, with running a business. Think about it, you know, one day you should sacrifice your employees and then to your suppliers and then maybe to your shareholders. And it's endless, it's meaningless, it provides no guidance in business. Business to be run well has to be run selfishly. You're maximizing shareholders' wealth. You're maximizing your own wealth. You're doing it because you love it. Any element of altruism that enters in there is destructive. Now, some conservatives recognize this contradiction that you're trying to live in. That is, greed, a little bit of greed is good. And they say, no. Greed is bad, period. Selfishness is bad, period. To quote Michael Novak, a, uh, uh, somebody who writes a lot in newspapers, a newspaper columnist, an op-ed writer, talks about envy and greed. He writes, neither of these two vices, notice that he puts them together, Neither of these two vices is attractive. The republic depends on the defeat of both. Envy embitters the soul and unravels community. Greed explodes the self like a cow eats too much. Or to reduce all the motives of businessmen and capitalists to greed is to set them up for sheer contempt. So the consistent conservatives realize that you can't live in a split world. You can't advocate altruism and at the same time advocate greed. Greed, by its nature, is selfish. Okay? You're greedy for your values, not somebody else's values. Which brings them to say, well, okay, markets are kind of good, but we need to regulate them. We need to enforce some kind of standards because since selfishness is bad and selfishness is at work in the market process, we can't let it go rampant. We have to put some constraints on it. And the conservatives... You know, they want to regulate less than the liberals, but they're not for separation of the economy from the state, like we would be for. Right? They just want to set different limits and less limits, maybe, than the liberals do. Now, in addition, 
conservatives ground their support for capitalism in ethics, in ethics and altruism, and in epistemology they grounded with, what they grounded with? Faith. Faith. That's right. To quote from an article uh, written by Peter Schwartz in The Intellectual Activist, he quotes in that article George Gilder as saying, Capitalism thrives on religious faith and decays without it. Now what does he mean by this? And this, is, this, is an, uh, this next quote I'm going to read it directly applies to finance. Think of long-term investing. You're investing in a new venture or you're making an investment in a stock. You have plans for the long term. It's risky. Right? Every investment in the stock market has risk. This is how he bases the reason for making these long-term investments. Right? We have learned that you calculate, you estimate what the cash flows are going to be into the future, um, what the profits are going to be, the risk involved, and you make some kind of calculation and come out with, it's worth it, it's not worth it. I should do it or not, given your preference for risk. How does Gilda describe this? Capitalists' progress is based on the acceptance of risks that cannot be demonstrated to pay off in any one lifetime. Thus, it relies on faith in the future and in providence. That is, you make an investment and you pray. And if it works out, then God's on your side that day. And if it doesn't, too bad. Now, what does this make of a stock market? And ma a casino makes it a stock market what the leftists would like us to believe it's a stock market. It brings the, the stock market down to the level of whim, of emotion. I, I believe I'm going to be successful today. I have faith today. T tomorrow I won't have faith. Or I have faith in stock A, I don't have faith in stock B. Epistemologically, it is completely corrupt, and therefore it completely corrupts all financial markets and the whole world of financial transactions. Now, one of the things conservatives try to do, and they've, they've developed many think tanks, and, and uh, they have lots of college professors who try to present the facts about markets. They say, look, markets work, markets create more wealth. Yeah, we believe this is, uh, and this is good for altruistic and, and religious reasons, but look, here are the economic facts. So the defense of capitalism beyond the defense in the, in the ethics and epistemology, which we know are ridiculous, the defense is, here are the economic facts. It increases, it raises our standard of living. And some people might say, well, isn't that enough? Isn't it enough to show that the facts are on our side, that the standard of living does rise with capitalism? Now, let's hold that, and we'll get back to that later. Okay? So that's the conservatives. They depend on altruism and faith. Let's look at the libertarians. And I promise not to spend a lot of time on this. Libertarians have no defense. That's why they're easy. Right? There is no philosophy, there is no ethics to base the defense on. Where did the libertarians start from? What's their axiom from which everything else is derived? Liberty, freedom. Okay. So they can say something like this. Freedom is good. Financial markets are consistent with freedom, therefore financial markets are good. That's it. What is freedom? We don't know. You know, the non-initiation of force, maybe. Why is freedom good? We can justify that. Or at least if they can, they, you've got a hundred different justifications depending on which libertarian you happen to speak to. So there are no ethical arguments, there are no ethical or epistemological justifications for capitalism. It's just good because it's consistent with some floating notion of, of freedom, of liberty. Now, if you go to the Austrian economists, many of which are libertarians, many of whom are libertarians, they have an excellent understanding of economics. They know the importance of the role of financial markets. What undermines the Austrians is the same thing that undermines the Libertarians. What undermines them is philosophy. The Austrians come from all different philosophies, all very corrupt, from von Mises' Kantianism to Hayek's subjectivism and distrust, complete distrust of reason and rationality. These philosophies undermine them. 
So again, they're left saying, and this is all they can say, they're left saying, listen, free markets increase our standard of living. Free markets are good for everybody because everybody benefits from them. They can't say more than that. In addition, one of the real weaknesses of Austrian economics, and, and uh, for this I'll refer you to um, uh, Dr. Beekner's course on, subjective, uh, on objective value. Austrians are subjectivists when it comes to valuation. So they believe that prices reflect the whims of the people buying and trading. Not their objective estimates of what the product is worth, but their emotions, what they feel that they are worth. So if you remember, we talked about socially objective value. Well, prices can't be objective, according to the Austrians. Because under socially objective value, prices are determined by the best rational estimates of the parties negotiating, based on their values and based on reality. Well, according to re the Austrians, it's not based on that. It's based totally on emotions. Now, should give them credit, and this, this is where you find one of the many contradictions in, in Austrian economics, but also uh, in general in the world around us, in people's ideas. You have to give the Austrian credits, on the one hand, for identifying the fact that prices provide us with important information. They're the ones who introduced this idea into economics. That prices are important because they uh, they incorporate into them information. The buying and selling incorporates into the prices important information. Now, how they, how they can say that on the one hand, and then say prices are subjective, I have no idea. But clearly this contradiction undermines their e even their economic argument, never mind their philosophic argument. Something incredible has arrived at Disney California Adventure Park. Darling, I want action. We're going big. Elegance. And we're going fast. And speed. The Incredicoaster is here and now open at Pixar Pier at Disney California Adventure Park. Bring your super family and your friends and come celebrate friendship and beyond at Pixar Fest before it ends September 3rd. Only at Disneyland Resort. Attractions and entertainment subject to change without notice. Okay, so ultimately what both libertarians and conservatives land up with is we have these great economic arguments for why financial markets and institutions should be free. The economic argument is based on what? On the standard of living. People's standard of living will rise. Clearly capitalism creates more wealth than socialism. We've got lots of evidence of that. You can point to lots of facts. And this is what they do. Lots and lots of concrete facts, theory, the economics are solid here. We can show you that this will produce more wealth than that. Why is this not enough? Well, for one, the liberals don't really care. They don't really care about the facts. And they don't, their goal is not to maximize wealth or to maximize the standard of living. The intellectuals in opposition to capitalism don't care about economics or about the facts. Now let me, to illustrate this, let me read you a quote from a House of Representatives report written for Dick Gephardt, the uh, House Minority Leader, on the issue of downsizing. Now it's a big, thick report. I'm just going to read you some of the paragraphs from the, from the final uh, few pages, from the last chapter. So this is a quote. Even if it were true that absolutely unregulated markets produced goods and services with the greatest efficiency and that ultimately they generate more wealth than markets subject to some level of public regulation, there are many among us who want more from society than simply wealth. You can't say it more explicitly than that. They go on to say, we have decided that even if efficient markets dictate that children can be profitably put to work at an early age, we will not allow it. We should also consider whether markets that dictate that workers should not have health benefits are serving society. And we should consider whether an economy that leaves such a tremendous share of the nation's, of the nation's young people at home without adequate adult guidance and supervision is really serving the needs of society, 
even if it is generating more cash. Okay. And government unions, environmental groups, and other organizations, which at times attempt to restrain market forces, are far from perfect. But it must be clearly understood that much of the torrent of criticism directed against them is not really about creating a better society, but simply about money and power. Government, unions, and those who advocate for causes such as the environment must work with corporations to find common ground. But they must also stand up to corporate excesses, negligence, irresponsibility, and selfishness, wherever they find it. No stable society can continue to exist if all wealth and power is concentrated in corporate boardrooms. These guys don't care about generating wealth. They don't care about increasing the standard of living. What they want, they have a certain social program that they would like to instill. And of course, the examples they give are ones that are given in order to evoke as much emotion as possible. Nobody wants to see children work unless the option is for them to die, which was the option in the 19th century and is the option in many countries in South America. So it's die or work. But they, of course, will never admit that such an um, option exists. Nobody wants to see people go without health care, without medical care. Okay. Is that really the issue? But they, they're trying to evoke these emotions. Okay. Or the issue of the children alone, alone at home while two parents are going to work. Right. We're supposed to feel sorry that that is happening. What? So the children aren't there. <laughs> yeah, the children are happy, that's right. <laughs> what they're trying to do is say economics doesn't matter, and they know why they're saying it. Why are they saying it? Because they know that, the, that capitalism does produce more wealth. I mean, Marx himself admitted this. But that is not the goal. That is not the purpose. The goal is not an increased standard of living. Later I'll read you a quote about... Um, the uh, trading off of, he calls it, GNP versus social tranquility. They're after other things, not economic growth, not a higher standard of living. The left, more so than the liberals, uh, more so than the conservatives, and definitely more so than the libertarians, focus on ideas. They are altruists, proud of it, and much more consistent than conservatives can ever be. So in a battle between the liberals and conservatives over altruism, who is going to win? The liberals, they're more consistent. And the fact is that they are winning. With the Republican House, with the Republican Senate, with the Republican President, the fact is that we're moving slowly but steadily towards the agenda set by the left. I mean, today we're arguing not about whether Social Security should or should not exist, but by what level it should be. We're not arguing about Medicare, whether it should or should not exist, by what level it should be. So the Republicans have accepted the liberals' agenda, they just want to tinker with it a little bit. Not whether they should or should not be taxes, but whether they should be a consumption tax, a flat tax, or a progressive tax. So the liberals are winning because they are more consistent. They don't care about the fact. They expect reality to adapt to their vision. They also, and we'll get back to this point, because that's an epistemological point that we'll address. They also recognize the wealth that is created under capitalism. They recognize the wealth that is created among financial institutions. And they view it as a fantastic opportunity to loot. I mean, even the conservatives do this. Think about the idea that Jack Kemp, for example, holds that we decrease taxes, tax rate, in order to get more revenue. So we're deregulating a little bit, so more wealth will be created so we can loot more of it. So the idea is, yes, we realize that giving you a little bit more freedom is good for you, we'll do it if we can get, because that could give us more, more money to redistribute to other people. More money to inflict our programs on you. They accept the Austrian view that values are subjective, and they take it to its ultimate consequence. That is, markets are subjective in general. Prices reflect no information. They're completely random. 
Markets are just a form of anarchy. Therefore, what do we need? We need regulation in order to enhance the functioning of the markets. You hear this excuse all the time. Right? In order to make the markets work better, we need to regulate them. And this is direct consequence of this subjectivist view of market. as some kind of random process. And a process that some people are going to exploit at the expense of other people. Okay? Therefore, we need some rules to set in in order to dictate, in order to uh, put order in the anarchy, and in order to make markets really reflect economic value. And the only way to do that is for the government to intervene. You know, in a sense, what they're saying, and, and the old-time liberals and leftists would say this, they're saying, we want to bring some rationality to the market by regulating it. Because all of you are subjectivists, and we need some kind of rational guidance for the markets. Now, new leftists wouldn't say that because they don't believe in reason. But the old line leftists would. Now, as tools of their campaign to destroy these markets, they use envy of success. And you see this all the time. Those greedy rich taking the money from the poor. Look at Michael Milken, how well he did. Look at uh, Bill Gates, how much money he has. And they seek out altruistic businessmen and put them up on a pedestal. You know the, the, the guy who, um, the businessman whose factory burned down and for two or three months he kept paying his employees uh, in order to stay on. Now, that could have been a very wise business decision. You know, these are valuable employees. You don't want to lose them. You keep them on the payroll so they stay with you and they stay loyal. But that was never the justification given for this. Not by that specific businessman and not by the media. He was the good guy sacrificing his wealth for the workers versus the greedy CEO of AT&T who dared to lay off 40,000 workers. And they, they, they would have these debates. You know, I don't know if there was a debate on PBS where they got this guy up and, and they used him. It, it was interesting how they phrased the question and how he answered because they got him to actually say, to denounce all the CEOs, all the companies that were laying off people. It makes no difference why. They are bad for laying off people. People come first. You have to be loyal to your employees. That is a primary. So by raising people like that, they make everybody else look like greedy scum, which is their intent. Okay, so we can't defend. It is futile to defend capitalism from an economic perspective. Futile to defend financial markets and institutions from a purely economic perspective. We have to go broader, we have to go deeper. So how should we defend financial markets and institutions? Well, first of all, what is obvious is that in order to, to defend financial markets and institutions, we have to defend capitalism. Capitalism is the only social system under which financiers and the markets and institutions they work for can function efficiently. Thus allowing them to provide savers with real return and at the same time supplying capital where it is most efficiently put to use. Only under a system where force is not an issue, where property rights are protected, where financiers are free of the distortions created by regulations and taxes, can financiers do their job and help businessmen maximize production, increase the productivity of labor, and increase wealth and increase economic growth and our, everybody's standard of living. So the only way to defend any one segment within the economy is to defend a free social system. And the only free social system that exists is capitalism. Now, of course, that is only the first step. To defend capitalism, you have to defend a whole philosophy. From politics to ethics to epistemology to metaphysics. Now, at this point, when I was writing my lecture, I said, OK, my first instinct was, now I'm going to go up to, to metaphysics, and then I'll say some stuff on metaphysics, then I'll go to epistemology and say some stuff there, and then to ethics. And I'll basically do a half-hour summary of OPA. 
And then I remembered unity. <laughs> and then I remembered they were speaking to a group that probably knows all this stuff, and it would be a waste of my time and their time to do that. Plus, it, it would be impossible. It would be meaningless to attempt to do that. So you have to realize that, that any of the points I'm giving now are within the context of a knowledge of a complete philosophy. Okay. So don't say, how can, you, how can you make this point without justifying it? And of course, in the context of today's lecture, uh, Dr. Peikoff's lecture, um, about induction, that should be obvious. Now, I'm going to try and make three points. <coughs> One in ethics and two in epistemology. You cannot defend capitalism without defending egoism. Profit maximization, shareholder wealth maximization are egoistic, selfish goals. And they need to be defended unapologetically. You can't hide behind some altruistic motive. Now, to the extent that our economy survives, the extent that there's productivity, the extent that people are making money, they are being selfish, whether they are willing to admit it or not. They are working for their values. It is only this selfishness that keeps us going. It only it is people's greed, it is people's values and their willingness to pursue those values that keeps our economy growing, that keeps production alive. Instead of then apologizing, saying, oops, I'm sorry I made so much money here, I'm going to hand it out, or I'm going to feel guilty for the rest of my life, like many businessmen do, they have to be able to defend selfishness and their egoistic goals. And they have to do so unapologetically. Not as the best outcome for society, but as my right to the earnings of my labor. None of them do this. Even the best among them, even the ones who give the best defense of the system, have this kind of level of defense. This is at the level of defense of the founding fathers. They would have stood up and said, I earned this, this is mine. They were true individualists, and they were true egoists, even, even though, again, they wouldn't explicitly say that because of, of the, you know, the philosophy of the time, the ideas of the time. So you cannot defend financial markets and institutions with altruism. And I've seen objectivists do this. I've seen objectivists say, you know, if only I can convince these altruists, if only I can convince them that capitalism would benefit everybody, then they'll agree with me that capitalism is good. And then I can deal with the other issues. As Leonard Peikoff says in OPA, one cannot combine the ethics of sacrifice with the politics of individualism. They just do not go together. And it is a mistake, a tragic mistake, to try. The only way to consistently defend the right of the producer, the businessman, the capitalist, to their profits, which is what needs to be done, is by a defense of egoism. The only way to validate individual rights, and particularly property rights, which are of particular importance to when dealing in, in economics, is through the ethics of egoism. And again, any other attempt is futile. So the key here is don't give in to that impulse saying, well, you'll all benefit as well. Stick to your guns. Yes. Hi, it's Jamie, progressive number one, number two employee. Leave a message at the... Hey, Jamie, it's me, Jamie. This is your daily pep talk. I know it's been rough going ever since people found out about your acapella group, Mad Harmony, but you will bounce back. I mean, you're the guy always helping people find coverage options with the Name Your Price tool. It should be you giving me the pep talk. Now get out there, hit that high note, and take Mad Harmony all the way to nationals this year! Sorry, this is pitchy. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. <clears throat> Going tying into this morning's lecture, don't you think it's necessary to do both in the following way, that many people have this false idea that if some benefit, others get hurt, and so they'll oppose capitalism by saying, yes, but 
you or others are going to get wealthy and you know, average guy is going to get poor or stuff like that. So I don't, don't you really need to defend it at both levels that it's, you know, people have a right to be selfish and it also is a system that by its nature makes everyone more wealthy. Well, I think you have to defend it both on the economic level and on the ethical level. You can't say just the ethics. And it's exactly the point Dr. Peikoff made today. You have to bring in the concretes and you have to say, look what happened in the 19th century when industrialists were given freedom to do what they wanted. Look at the Industrial Revolution. Look at what's happening today in Silicon Valley. Where, look at industries that are not regulated versus industries that are regulated. You have to provide the concretes. But you can't provide the concretes and leave it there. And you What's worse is to provide the concretes and then say what unites all of these is that everybody is ultimately better off. What you need to say is all these people are pursuing their selfish interest and that is good. That is what we want them to do. And yes, by the way, this brings up everybody's standard of living and everybody benefits from it. But that is the order in which it needs to be presented, not everybody benefits from it and somehow from that I can derive my right to keep my own profit. You can't do that. You have to start with your right to keep your own profit, with your right to make your own money, with your right to make your own decisions, the right, your right to your own life. And from there you go to the, to the secondary point, which yes, this greedy pursuit of profits also leads to everybody else's benefit. And, and to some extent that's not even true. I mean, there might be some people who lose out. But you say, you know, tough. Any other questions? Yeah. What is the correct use of the word greedy? You just said that in the greedy pursuit of profits, if you're pursuing your own interests, how can you be greedy? Okay, I, I, I should have, I actually don't have, I had a definition, a good definition of greed, but I don't have it here. Um, greedy can be used in two contexts, one wrong, <laughs> one wrong and one right, I believe. The wrong way to perceive it, and this if you open up a dictionary and look under greedy, it will say something like an excessive pursuit of wealth or an excessive pursuit of material goods. And then you look under excessive and see what it says in the dictionary. But who defines what excessive is? What is excessive? By whose standards? By whose criteria? So I think that definition is ridiculous. No, this is good. What's the definition there? Strong desire for more food, wealth, etc., especially for more than is right or reasonable. That's not good, right? <laughs> more than is right or reasonable? But more than is right or reasonable. Ah, okay. So if you took reasonable. out the okay. land, now by whose standard? Right or reasonable by what standard? By egalitarian standard? Then everybody's greedy, right? So I would throw out that definition. I think that is the wrong use of the word greedy. I think that greedy means to be passionate about the pursuit of something you want. So you should be greedy in love, and greedy in food, and greedy in pursuit of money, and greedy in pursuit of your career, and greedy in everything, because we want to be passionate valuers. We want to really care, and we want to really work, our, you know, work as hard as we can in order to pursue the goals that we have. <laughs> yes, that was included in the first one. <laughs> Um, yep. Since the word selfish, though, seems to just rub people, so you, know, you get such a strong reaction when you use that word. Is there any other, uh, I guess I'm looking for another word yeah. that I can first approach people with and then use okay. selfish, or is it just... Well, what I use know? with my students, I use my students, I use rational self-interest. So with the rational up front, so, so they don't just blank out. You know, because that's what they do when you, when you say selfish or egoist. They say ra rational, rational self-interest or rational egoism. I present objectivism as the theory of rational egoism. And then, they, and then I, I distinguish that from um, other forms of supposed egoism, you know, like Nietzschean or subjectivists, hedonists. And I say, here are the two types. We're gonna, when I say egoism from now on, I mean rational egoism. And that they're willing to accept, because now there's the rational fundament, mean it's thought out, it's not whatever you feel like doing, it's not stepping on anybody who's in your way. And then you can start introducing. So I think having that rational fund is helpful in introducing the concepts to a new audience.
if I could just say in the word yeah. greedy, uh, for my own use in discussing this with people, I, I make a careful point to them that the only way I will use the word greedy is as a desire for the unearned. Thing. Well, yes, but I hate to give the concept to them because I think it's a very useful one because I think there's some people who, who uh, may be selfish but not greedy. It is the kind of laid back, and they don't really pursue their values with full. And they are ones that are greedy, and I like the ones that are greedy more than I like the ones that are not. So I think it's a useful term to have. Um, I do the what I do with my students is the first class. I uh, ask them, "How many of you want to do well in your careers? I mean, really well." And you know, ninety percent of the class raises their hand. And I say, "How many of you want to make a lot of money?" You know, eighty percent of the class raises their hand. And then I say, "You all." Greedy. Something's wrong here, right? What's the deal? And then we get into a whole discussion of greed and what it means. And I, I actually open my class on finance and ethics. That is the first class I teach. And, and we start talking on, about greed and what is its significance and then why is it being attacked. And, and I have them look it up in the dictionary and come up with a different, uh, you know, these kind of definitions. And I ask them, excessive by whose standard and so on. So... It turns out to be a fun class, and it, it really gets them hooked because they start thinking, well, am I being excessively, you know, do I want too much money? How do I measure it? By whose standard? And they come up with a normal subjectivist answer, you know, society standard or some average or something like that. Um, but it's, it's a great lead in. So I, I think, A, it has some good shock value as a motivator for people to listen, but B, it's a concept I would hate to give up. Okay. Now... The next point I'd like to make is epistemological. Now, it is no accident that in OPA, Dr. Peikoff, under the chapter of capitalism, in the three sections, he has three sections on capitalism, two of them are epistemological. The sections in OPA are capitalism as the moral social system, which is the one from ethics. Then capitalism as the system, system of objectivity, where he talks about socially objective value and philosophically objective value, which we touched on, on this course, in this course. And his final section is opposition to capitalism as dependent on bad epistemology. And that's where I'd like to focus on. I think it's important to understand that the people we are fighting against, the people who oppose capitalism, are opposed to it based on a bad epistemology. They oppose it based on an anti-reason mentality. And this is the core of the reason why facts and economic theory is not enough. And to quote again from Opar, page 406, Truth does not force itself on men's minds. Intrinsicism is false. If men are to grasp truth, they must perform a definite cognitive process. End quote. So in order for people to be able to recognize the facts, recognize the truth, it doesn't just imprint itself on their brain. It's not like the, on the perceptual level, you see something, that's it. They actually have to think about it. They actually have to figure it out, to integrate it. And to do that, you need reason. Okay. The anti-capitalist mentality depends depends on a denial of reason. It depends on the denial of our ability to abstract from concretes to abstractions, to abstract from all these facts to a theory that unites them. And you see this a lot with liberals. They say, oh yeah, it worked in this case, but how do you know it'll work over there? Or it worked in three million cases before, but how do we know it's going to work over here? And what are the social consequences? They deny the ability to know reality with certainty. For them, reality is floating. It is something to be molded by their wishes. They deny the ability to be objective. They deny the fact that there are real truths, that there, are real, that there is real certainty, that there is objective reality. As a consequence, they accept contradictions. And you find, uh, you're discussing issues like this with some people, and they, they, they explicitly say something contradicts itself, and they say so. Especially ones with PhDs. You don't find that too much with people, you know, with just common people, non-intellectuals. And they also accept, or at least present, emotions 
as tools of cognition. That is, emotions are a valid way of presenting an argument. It is valid to appeal to emotions in order to persuade somebody. And this is one of the dominant ways of persuasion. As we'll see, I have some, some really good quotes. Modern intellectuals are deaf to facts. They really don't care. They have their theories. They have their ideas of what they want. Now let's take, let's do an example, okay, try and concretize this. Let's take the question of corporate restructurings that we talked about the last two classes. Corporate restructurings and takeovers. Now we know that Robert Reich objects to them. Right? We saw lots of quotes. He says they use too much debt, they cause bankruptcies, they bring about layoffs, they reduce competitiveness, they enrich the rich and powerful at the expense of the poor. While they increase, they might increase wealth, society as a whole does not benefit. This is Robert Reich's claim. Now what if we showed him study after study that says that restructurings actually increase wealth and efficiency, that employment has gone up, not down like he claims, that bankruptcies he predicted never happened, that the U.S. is more competitive because of them, not less, that the bad occurrences that did happen, like the SNL crisis, can almost always be shown to originate in government policies. Will it change his mind? No. What is he going to do? He's going to dismiss the facts, tell a horror story about a family that broke up because of layoffs. He'll focus on concretes, denying the theory. He will call us to a higher purpose, a higher social purpose. He'll switch topics, and all of this time, he'll claim to be a strong supporter of free markets. And the contradiction will never bother him. In other words, he'll appeal to emotions, putting them above facts. He'll attempt to confuse the issue, deny the theory is relevant, espouse contradictions, empty concepts from their content, refuse to define the concepts that he uses, and deny the existence of facts and objectivity. Now, if you don't believe me, there's some quotes here for you. Now, there are very few good guys out there in terms of people who defend financial markets and CEOs and so on. One of the few is a guy named Al Chainsaw Dunlop. Now, anybody with a name like Chainsaw has to be a good guy. Right. He was the CEO of uh, Scott Paper. And he turned that company from a complete failing, approaching bankruptcy, very, very diversified conglomerate into a highly efficient, focused, profitable company. He has, he has left, and he made a lot of money doing this. He made a lot of money at, while he was the CEO. But at the same time, he, I think, more than doubled the stock price of the stock. Okay. So shareholders did very, very well. Oh, he sold the company. Okay. Uh, Alan Dunlop says, this is a discussion of various experts, supposed experts, on downsides. Alan Dunlop says, what's happened is that people in this country are starting to come to grips with the fact that the point of business is to make a profit. Profit, gentlemen, is not a dirty word. And this is Reich, Robert Reich's response. But free markets do not exist in a state of nature, and neither do corporations. They reflect laws, social judgments about how we're going to organize ourselves. Those judgments reflect choices made implicitly or explicitly about the kind of society we want. And we can't avoid those choices. We may pretend that they don't exist, but we are making them. Now notice that he brings it right down to the level of ideas. He doesn't argue with them on the level of profits. He's arguing on the level of ethics. As homeschoolers, our family loves using time for learning because it provides us with so much flexibility with when and how we teach. With 24-7 access to the award-winning online curriculum, you can't go wrong. We can start lessons after breakfast, in the evening, or even while traveling. I love focusing on the concepts I want to teach my kids that week rather than having to follow a preset path. With time for learning, the possibilities are endless. Visit timeforlearning.com slash dreambig today. What is a good society, Al? 
profitable companies may contribute to a good society. Now he's asked the question, what is a good society? Which he never answers. He never answers this question. All he does is say things like, profitable companies may contribute to good society, but ultimately the end is not profit. We want to have a society in which most people have a chance at a sta higher standard of living. We want a society that has a moral character. What moral character? He never says. In which there is a degree of trust among people and, in a, and a deepening sense of what it means to be a human being. A profound statement which is never defined. Now why is it never defined? Why do you think they say stuff like, we want a moral society. We want to have a profound, deep sense of what it means to be a human being and so on. Why are they using these kind of words? He can't say the actual thing. He doesn't want to take your money and give it to somebody else. If he came out and said, we want egalitarianism. We, A, want to be in control and all of you guys distribute. We want to distribute all everybody else's wealth among you. Then nobody would vote for him. Nobody would like him. Nobody would listen to him. But he knows that if he says the right words, each one, of, each, each one of the people listening will fill in their own blanks. Some moral society. Oh, okay. So for me, morality is this and this. Yeah, I agree with uh, Reich. This is what I want. We want a society that benefits society. How? He never says, but yeah, I want a, I want a society that's good for everybody. I want a deepening sense of what it means to be a human being. Okay, all these things are so floating that the common man that they are aimed at can fill in the blanks. So Rice purposely never defines what it is that he means by this. That's leaving us all to interpret it. Now just some other examples of... Uh, this, this is an amazing... Uh, another participant in, uh, in this is uh, George Gilder. Now Rice has just finished... Uh, saying how AT&T is terrible for laying off 40,000 people. And Gilda says, Gilda says to him, so you're assuming that AT&T is an example of a very profitable company that has irrationally chosen. Rice says, no, not irrationally. Or offensively? No, not offensively. Or culpably or questionably? George, George, listen to me. I didn't question the morality of AT&T which is exactly what he had done. In fact, I am very much against villainizing any of these people. And if you know anything about Robert Reich, that's all he's been doing for the last 15 years. And with regard to whether they did it wisely, the share price went up. I mean, he's even seeding the fact that share prices reflect something. By some measures, AT&T did precisely what it ought to have done. But the fundamental question is, where the society is better off. Okay. So he said all these good things and then he undercuts it all with this society is better off. Now what does it mean for society to be better off? Rice doesn't answer this, but listen to this other guy. This is Lutwak. He is uh, a fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in D.C. My personal conclusion is that when a country is as rich as in GNP, and as poor in social tranquility as is the United States, it makes no sense to purchase more GNP. Now, think of this idea. First of all, we are rich in GNP. GNP is gross national product. And we can purchase GNP. Okay? So wealth is something to be purchased. Okay? Now, how do we purchase GNP? Listen to this. Through deregulation and increased efficiency at the expense of tranquility. It's like a man with 24 ties and no shoes buying himself another tie. So, what? The money is units of tranquility. You pay yes, yeah, somehow we can measure tranquility. And of course, economic success is opposite of tranquility. Economic growth is the opposite of tranquility. And uh, these are two things that we're trading one against the other. I uh, just... Uh, Two other short examples of how they put in emotions into this. How they use emotional arguments instead of dealing with the facts. George Gilder goes on in a whole segment about how good the 1980s are and how people are misusing statistics and how they really were a great era and productivity went up and so on. And he ends by saying, 
um, about, how, about this assumption that they were a bad period, he says, there's just no evidence for it, except in just one lonely statistics that you people lovingly cultivate, which is wages. And this is Blackwell, who's an economist for labor unions, response. I spend more time standing on people's back porches and in union halls than I spend lovingly caressing the wage data. But I can tell you there's a lot of pain in America today. There's a lot of fear out there. And then Robert Reich to the same point. People tell me they're worried. They're wondering about their jobs. They're worried about keeping their jobs. These are the kitchen table conversations that Americans all across the land are having. So it's this, tra there's no tranquility, there's anxiety, there's fear, everybody's worried about their job. And of course, why are they worried? I would say. I mean, I'd propose that they're worried maybe because these guys keep telling them they should be worried. I mean, when you have these headlines about millions of casualties on the battlefields of business, when you have these people going on TV on the radio continuously saying that these layoffs are going to destroy America, everybody should be worried. So um, they directly appeal to emotions, to this fear, to this anxiety that people have. And they use these stories about sitting with working class people and how worried working class people are. Okay. Now, what do you need in order to overcome all this garbage? And in order to get a perspective of what is real and what isn't. What do you need in order to integrate all the massive amount of data, <laughs> the massive amount of information, the complex economic ideas, to integrate those economic ideas then with ethical ideas? There's only one way to do that. The only tool available for, to us is reason. Reason is the only tool we can use to integrate this vast and complex amount of theory and information. And to deny reason, like these guys do, is to deny the ability to do that. And then you can say whatever the hell you want. Because it doesn't matter. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to define anything. You can just float abstractions out there and let other people fill them with content as they wish. Dr. Ben Swanger in the Objectivist Forum in August 1981 writes, in the philosophical battle for free society, the one crucial connection to be upheld is that between capitalism and reason. The religious conservatives are seeking to tie capitalism to mysticism. The libertarians are, trying, are tying capitalism to whim-worshipping subjectivism and anarchy. To cooperate with either group is to betray capitalism, reason, and one's own future. So I think it's important to understand that if we, had, in order to defend against these attacks, in order to counterattack, we have to identify the, the fatal flaw, and that is the denial of reason. And I think most Americans, I don't think most Americans can recognize that that's what's going on, but I think that when that is identified, even on a common sense level, when you ask them, what does excessive mean, when so talking about the definition of greedy, what do these words mean? What do these concepts mean? It gets them to think. It gets them thinking about these kinds of ideas. I think you have to attack this on the level of epistemology. Okay, the last point I'd like to make is one that kind of summarizes uh, a lot of things that we've been talking about. And that is the question that I, I think I posed at some point. Why is it? that in every newspaper article that we've seen, and all these quotes in Wall Street, the movie, finance is depicted as war. Why is it that this is a violent, is predicted with such violence? You remember the, worry, the Wall Street warriors, entrenched warfare. What is it about finance that makes, or what is it about the, the epistemology of the people attacking finance? that make this connection, that causes them to make this connection. Anybody got? Yeah. Uh, war is a non-productive, or at least 
materially non-productive uh, activity. Yes, not only is it non-productive, war is destructive. Now, these people think of finance as not only as not being productive, but as being destructive. Now, how is it destructive? You remember the crumbs that fall off the cake? And that's where financiers make their money off. The, the cake that's given, they just collect the crumbs. Well, if you believe that we live in a zero-sum game, that is, there is a certain amount of wealth out there. You can't increase it. Just give it. And all that finance does is divvy it up. Okay, you get a small piece, you get a large piece. In the meantime, we take little crumbs. Okay. Taking those little crumbs is destructive. Taking little cr those little crumbs is at somebody else's expense. Those little crumbs are an act of, and it can be perceived as an act of violence. Yeah? You're taking something that you have not earned, that you do not deserve. So they view the world as a zero-sum game. Now, the whole idea of a zero-sum game is absurd. I know you have to do is open your eyes and look at the world. See how we lived 500 years ago, and look how we live today, and hey, it's not a zero-sum game. Some wealth has been created between then and now. Just a little, yeah. Yet, there are many people who believe this. If I make money, it's at somebody's expense. Human beings do not create anything. Now, I think the, the, the interesting epistemological point, and, and it took, I didn't get this at first, and it, uh, I read an article by Harry Benswang entitled um, The Dollar and the Gun. It was published in Objectives Forum in June 1983. And it makes this whole issue very clear. What they are doing is they are equivocating between economic power and political power. Between economic power and the use of force, physical force. You know those discussions that you have, that I've had at least, with, with people who say, well, but, but corporations, big business really has force, right? They can fire people. They can let them go. That is an act of violence, a force against those people being laid off. Libertarians use this a lot because a lot of libertarians are against big business. And they equate big business with government. Big business has force. Now, if you think about a zero-sum game world in which the businessman is not creating anything but just dividing it up, dividing what is created, I don't know how, among his employees, and they have a right to their share of the pie, then you're right. You're denying them the share of the pie. You are exerting force on them. So it is the idea of equating economic power with physical force. And the only thing that makes this equivocation possible is this view of a zero-sum game, which makes economic power seem like political power. Now, what, it, what do we mean by political power? What I mean by political power is the fact that the government has a monopoly over the use of force. The private citizen does not use force. What they are doing is they are saying, the government doesn't have the monopoly. Look, these businesses are using force as well. To quote uh, Dr. Binswanger, it blackens, this equivocation, blackens the legitimate, peaceful, self-interested activities of traders on a free market by equating these activities with the predatory actions of criminals and tyrannical governments. And of course, once you do that, it's not, e it's not difficult to prosecute them and send them to jail. We talked about this, about how you villainize them, you portray them as villains every way, you show that they're not productive, it's a small step to put them in jail from there, which is exactly what happened in the 1980s. It also opens up the door for what? Look, if you view financiers as carrying weapons and dangerous people, then it is, what is the government's role? Well, the government's role is to protect us against physical force. So it is legitimate, therefore, for the government to step in and regulate these businesses. Because all they are doing is they're preventing the use of physical force against citizens. So this falls under the legitimate role of government, right? What it does, to quote Dr. Benswang, is it whitewashes the interventionist actions of government by equating them with benevolent, productive actions of businesses and private individuals. So all the government is doing is 
It's helping out the process. It's getting rid of the violence. It's getting rid of the, uh, of the use of force within these markets. Okay. How do we fight this particular disease? You have to identify the fact that the individual, that individuals are the source of wealth, that man is an end in himself, and that wealth is unlimited, literally unlimited. It's only by making these identifications, by proving this, that you can separate out economic power and political power. It's only by making sure that people understand where wealth comes from and that wealth is unlimited. It is only limited by the ability of human beings to innovate, which is unlimited. Okay, so in summary, only objectivism. Only objectivism provides us with a philosoph philosophical system that integrates everything we've talked about in this course. And of course, a lot more. And therefore, only objectivism can defend capitalism and consequently, financial markets and institutions. So in this course, I've attempted to illustrate the importance of free, efficiently functioning financial markets, their importance to capitalism, and to the continued survival of the market economy that we live in today. Free financial markets are essential to the preservation and hopefully growth of our standard of living. Financial markets and institutions are the hearts, veins, and arteries of a free enterprise system. Yet, as we have seen, these markets and institutions have always been under attack by an army of viruses that threaten to destroy them. These viruses continue to block, inhibit, and frustrate the functioning of the system. These viruses are made possible by the countless evil philosophies that have reigned the earth. They, have, they are made possible by mysticism, by irrationality, by altruism. It is only the ingenuity of countless financiers that have allowed financial markets, the circulatory system of our economy, to continue functioning. To defend and defeat these viruses, a consistent pro-reason, pro-individual, pro-capitalism philosophy is needed. Thanks to Ayn Rand, we have one. To preserve our lives, to preserve the remnants of the economic system that gives us life, like the life provided by our hearts, we must fight for the only philosophy that can save this world, objectivism. Thanks. All material in this program is protected by copyright and may not be reproduced in any form or manner, nor played before a live audience without the express written permission of the producer, the Ayn Rand Institute. For further information or to order other products, please visit eStore.AynRand.org or call one 800 Seven two nine six one four nine 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 one four nine